I couldn't have picked a better song than the second song that we sang as a prelude to this morning's message. The words in that song go, I will build my life. I will put my trust in you alone, a firm foundation. And today as we kick off another mini-series in the middle of this big series that we're on this year at New Hope, and if you've forgotten about it, it's on the front of your bulletin, Unlock, A Life of Discipleship and Service. And uh, we're going to be kicking off looking at the Word of God today as we talk about the subject of discipleship. And the Word of God is a timeless, firm foundation and it ought to be the foundation of our lives as Christians. I think many of you are probably aware of the statistic or the fact that the Bible is the best-selling book of all time. What you might not be familiar with is this, though. The Bible is the best-selling book every single year. It's not just the totality of it being the best-selling book, but still yet to this day in 2023, it is the best-selling book year after year after year. When did that get started? I can tell you exactly. 501 years ago in September. On September the 21st, 1522, that was the opening of the annual book fair in Leipzig, Germany. And that is when the Bible first started being sold after its first printing on the Gutenberg Press. Okay? And ever since then, 501 years in a row, without exception, the Bible has been the best-selling book of all time. I thought it might be good. Now, um, that's, that's an excess of 5 billion getting close to 6 billion copies. The second closest book are the writings of Tao. And he's not halfway there yet. And I don't know if you know, folks, but 2.5 billion is a long ways apart. That's a long way apart. I thought it might be a good idea for us this morning, since the Bible is the most read and most sold book of all time, I figured we have a lot of experts here today, and so we will do a short Bible quiz, all right? Just five quick questions. Let's see how you do, okay? Where is the first tennis match mentioned in the Bible? <laughs> see, if I ask you the first baseball game, we would know that, right? <laughs> well, Genesis 1-1, in the big inning, all right? But, but, but that's, not, that's not today's question, all right? Absolutely, Tom. See, a preacher knew the answer to that question. When Joseph served in Pharaoh's court, all right? Second question for you. This one will be easy. Many of you will get this one. Which Bible character... Not talking about Adam. Which Bible character had no parents? Tom? Oh, well, no, Chip, the... well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, well, yeah. Nope. But no, that will work. I'll accept that. But Joshua, he was the son of none. <laughs> hey. Hey. Next, what kind of man was Boaz? Before he got married, he was ruthless. <laughs> For those of you who may not know your Old Testament story, he married Ruth, all right? So before he married, he was ruthless, all right? Uh, number four, what is one of the first things Adam and Eve did after getting kicked out of the Garden of Eden? They raised a little Cain. <laughs> Their sons were Cain and Abel, all right? Last one, just for kicks and grins. What excuse did Adam give to his children as to why they no longer lived in Eden? Your mother ate us out of house and home. Uh, 
All right, did any of you get all five of those? <laughs> no, I didn't think so. I didn't either. But, but let me get serious now. Most of us who are Christians, we would admit that when we entered into a relationship with Christ, we did so because we realized two things. We realized, first of all, that we were minimally dysfunctional and ultimately corrupt. That's a very fancy way of saying we made the discovery that we were sinners, that we have been living in independence of God. Whether we invited Christ in our life at the age of five, as I did, I have to be honest, when I was asked, why are you doing this? And I said, because I'm a sinner. Well, what kind of sins have you committed? Well, I could think of a few. As I got older, I discovered the sins I described were the outflow of my sinfulness. I was a sinner because I was independent from God. So we are minimally dysfunctional and ultimately corrupt. At that moment, I think most of us would agree, at the moment that we became a child of God... We also had a reservation in heaven. When we became a Christian, we moved from being identified as a sinner to a child of God. And our eternal destiny is reserved for us in heaven. Agreed? We all pretty well figured that out. But another question for you. At that moment, whether you were 5 or 55 or 85... Whatever that moment was, when you invited Christ in your life and you became a Christian, at that moment was the influence of your dysfunction and your corruption gone. Let me ask you this. Do you think it's gone yet? I think we would all agree no. A quick theology lesson. You see, at that moment that we became a Christian, our position in Christ was established. Our position in Christ. Who we are. In other words, the day I was born, December 14th, 1954, in a hospital in Blythe, California, that day, my position in the Roland family was established. But the condition of my place in the family has been of ongoing development. It's been a growing, building, developing relationship. I am not the same infant that I was back then. So our position in Christ was established when we became a Christian, but our condition at that moment is just getting started. It's a little bit like taking out a lifetime membership at the health club. The first day I enroll, if it were today, would be obvious to you, it hasn't had a lot of impact yet. And just like being a member of a health club, becoming a member of God's family, until we engage with the tools that God has provided for us, the Word of God on our lives until we begin to exercise with those tools that He's given to us, there won't be much difference in our condition from the day our position was established 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, 40, 50 years later. It requires putting into practice those things that come with our position into his family. The faith process is called discipleship. And it begins and it continues and it ends with the Bible. It begins. It continues. And it will bring to finality our connection to the Word of God. Let me illustrate from the Scriptures. Romans 10, 13 through 17. This is how it gets started for us. Everyone, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be what? Saved. How then can they call on one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in one in whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they are sent? And as it is written, how beautiful are feet of those who bring the good news, the word of God. Consequently, faith comes by hearing the message and the message is heard through 
the Word of God. This is how it starts, folks, for every one of us. Until the Word of God confronted our dysfunctional condition, we could not make a decision for change. How does this continue then? That's how it starts, but how does it continue? Peter talks about it in his first letter, chapter 2, verse 2. Timothy talks about it in 2 Timothy chapter 3, where both these authors say this, like newborn babes, and I love the next word, crave. In the middle of watching a movie, do you ever get a craving? There are many times, Sean, I go to the movies and I say, we're not buying popcorn. And guess what happens in the middle of the movie? We begin to crave. It's an insatiable appetite that we can't think about. If I have a half gallon of ice cream in the freezer in our home, about 2 a.m., I wake up. It's why we don't keep it. Shelly will ask you, rarely do we keep ice. Why? Because I will not go back to sleep till I walk in there, get a spoon, and eat out of that half gallon container. There is this thing that won't shut off in my brain. Do you ever have a craving for the Word of God like that? It ought to be daily. Crave pure spiritual milk so that by it we may grow in our salvation. Grow how? To where we move from milk to meat. Now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. And Paul says all scripture. God breathed is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, training in righteousness. So the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. That's how this thing continues. Not disconnected from the word. In the word. And how does it proceed and conclude Paul once again, 2 Corinthians 3.18. And we all, who's left out of this? Not a one of us. And we all, who with unveiled faces, what do we do? We contemplate the Lord and His glory. And as a result of that contemplation, we are being transformed. Present, progressive sense. I have been, I continue to be, I will be transformed into His image with ever-increasing glory, which comes where? From the Lord, who is the Spirit. Ladies and gentlemen, this is not a secret. There is no discipleship apart from the Word of God. There is no discipleship in the bylaws of New Hope Community Church. There is no discipleship in the statement of faith of New Hope Fellowship. There is only discipleship in the Word of God. It is not the leather or the paper or the ink that is sacred. It is the words in this book that are. John chapter 1 verse 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, capital W, and the Word, capital W, was with God, and the Word, capital W, was God. God wanted us to understand that in the beginning, before creation ever took place, the Word existed. And the written Word we have today is to point all of us to the living Word who is His Son, Jesus Christ, who you and I are to be transformed into His image through the process of discipleship. No other way. And the psalmist understood this way back in the Old Testament before a New Testament was ever written. When the psalmist wrote in Psalm 119.11, when he said, I have hidden, O Lord, your word, where? In my heart. For what purpose? That I might not sin against you. You want there to be less sin in your life? Put more word in your life. It's not complicated, folks. The story is told of the night the Green Bay Packers lost an away game that they were expected to win by a large amount. After a long bus ride back home, their legendary coach, Vince Lombardi, made the players put their sweaty uniforms back on and march out onto Lambeau Field, their home field. The coach huddled all those men together, and he got in the middle of that circle, and he held up a pigskin, an egg-shaped object in the air, and he said, gentlemen, this is a football. And I hold up to you today, ladies and gentlemen, this is the Word of God. You see, what Coach understood on Lambeau Field was this. The way that you win in the game of football is having a clear understanding of the most basic principles of the game. 
And for you and I to be victorious in the Christian life, we have to have a clear understanding of the basics of life. This is the Word of God. Apart from Jesus Christ, there is nothing more essential for you, you and I to understand than the value the value, the extreme, uncomparable value of the Word of God to your life. It needs to be important as breath is to living. You cannot function as a Christian without it. Leads me to a key question. How can we know God and His will for my life? You see, knowing with confidence that this book is the Word of God and this is God's truth and will for our lives and knowing how to read it and understand it for ourselves, that last line is important. Begin to read it and understand it for yourself. There are so many Christians throughout the world today that show up on a Sunday morning church service with the intent of being spoot fed a little bit of God's Word, hoping it'll get them through until the next Sunday when they can show up again and the preacher can put it in their mouths for them. Don't misunderstand us preachers love to do it. But we want you to feast during the week all on your own. Coming back with a better sense of understanding the next week of the message you're going to hear and what it may do for your life. There's got to be individual engagement in the process of the Word of God. How else are we going to know? If we're not in the Word, how are we going to know such important life matters as who is the one true and living God? I don't want you to just take my word for it. I want you to know that for yourselves. How are we to know how much it is that God loves us? How are we going to know how grace is to abound and impact and influence our lives? How are we going to know about our birth into sin and our separation from God? How are we going to know about the payment that Jesus paid for us? How are we going to discover the best way to live a contented and productive life? Paul, who said, I have learned... It didn't just drop on me in the middle of the night. I learned to be content. It is Jesus who said, you are the, you are the, uh, the vine. I, am, I mean, I am the vine. You are the branches. And when you live in this kind of relationship with me, your life will be productive. What kind of production? You will live a life filled with love. You will live a life overflowing with peace and joy and contentment and satisfaction and goodness and kindness and mercy. Do you live that kind of life? It comes from our being in the Word. It's also where we learn the truth about our future and God's ultimate redemption of all His creation. You see, the Bible not only claims to give answers to these questions, but it invites you and I to believe and embrace that and so much more. The transformative power of God's Word, it is unparalleled and it is unmatched. When an American army stormed across Okinawa, soldiers found villages of unbelievable poverty and ignorance and filth. But Shimabuke was a very small, obscure community. It was significantly different. Homes and streets were clean. The villagers were poised and calm and cultured. They enjoyed a, a, a high level of health and intelligence and prosperity and happiness compared to the other communities around them. Why was Shimabuke different? Because 30 years before, an American missionary on his way to Japan had briefly stopped there. And before he moved on, he had the privilege of leading two of the more mature men in that village to Jesus. And what did he leave them? One Bible. One Bible. And he moved on to Japan. From that day, the people of Shimabuke saw no other missionary, heard no other preacher, had no other visit from a Christian group or organization, but over the next 30 years, those two middle-aged to elderly men made the Bible come alive. Every member of that community became a Christian. And 30 years later, here comes the American army. Clarence Hall was a war correspondent, and he writes, I strolled through Shimabuke one day, and I walked with a tough old army sergeant. As we walked 
he turned to me and he whispered hoarsely, I can't figure it out, fella. This kind of people coming out of only a Bible and a couple of old guys who wanted to love Jesus. And then what he added to me was an infinitely more penetrating observation. That sergeant said, you know, just maybe we've been using the wrong kind of weapons to make this world over. The power, the transformative power of the Word of God leads us to a key idea. I believe the Bible is the inspired Word of God, and as a result, this ought to guide your life and your life and your life and my life if I say that I'm a Christian. We would only want to give this book to, write our, to guide our lives if we truly believe it is from God. I'm going to give you a small seminary semester-long class in the next 10 minutes. Three big concepts, so you're going to get the thumbnail. Three big concepts we need to understand, and then we can decide for ourselves whether we think this book is for us. Big concept number one, the Bible is inspired breathed out by God himself. The Bible explicitly makes this claim. I've already read it to you. All scripture is God-breathed. And the Greek word the author uses for God-breathed is theonostos. It's the same word used to translate the original Hebrew word into Greek that's found in Genesis 2-7, where God breathed life into Adam. And the scripture says, he became a living soul. And the writer of Hebrews confirms this claim when he says, the word of God, it is alive and it is active. Many books we read can be truly inspiring. They can stir something special in us. The Bible certainly has proved to be inspiring in this way. But to say the Bible is inspired is to claim that it is much more than that. God himself inspired this book, these words. It's a live and living organism. The word leaps from the pages into our souls. And what does it do? It enables us not to sin anymore. What does this actually mean? How did this Bible, these these two testaments and these 66 books, how did they come together? Contrary to what some may think, the Bible didn't fall out of heaven in a leather cover. It didn't come through a pair of dice rolling around in the bottom of a hat. Rather, the Word of God came to us over a long time through the oversight of God in four specific phases. Revelation, inspiration, transmission, and translation. Let me just highlight that. Phase one, revelation. This phase simply refers to God's ongoing decision to reveal himself to the world. Paul's letter to the Romans tells us that God reveals himself to all people externally through nature. This is called general revelation. Here's what Paul said. Since the creation of the world... God's invisible qualities, His eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, been understood from what has been made so that the people were without excuse. You look at around at this incredible creation, an earth that turns on its axis, that rotates in an orbit. It's just one small part of all creation and we wonder, how could this be? And there's a testimony that there must be a God. God reveals Himself also to everyone internally through our own conscience. Romans 2.14, when Gentiles who do not have the law, they didn't have a spiritual book to read from, do do things required naturally by the law, they are a law for themselves, even though they do not have the written law. They show the requirements is written in their hearts, their conscience, bearing witness, their thoughts, sometimes accusing them, and other times even defending them. In other words, even when you haven't been told, there's no such thing as a lie, but you know you just lied. When you take something that belongs to somebody else, though maybe you've never been told that it, what it means to steal, you know that you've stolen. When you commit sexual sins that are outside the, the will of God for your life, why is there often that guilty feeling? That's... That's our conscience bearing witness with us that these are not the things and the practices and the will of God for us. 
The internal sense of right and wrong, the existence of God himself written in the code of our conscience. God also reveals himself through special revelation to a specific person at a specific, specific time with a specific message like Moses in the burning bush, like Moses on the mountain when he received the Ten Commandments, like Isaiah, like Joseph, like, like Mary and Joseph in the New Testament with the angels telling them, hey, y'all are going to be a mom and dad and you've never ever been together. Wow, what a special revelation. Then we have second phase, inspiration. Along with revelation, there's inspiration. God revealed or breathed his message into chosen people to be written down in the Old Testament. It was primarily the prophets, while in the New Testament, primarily the apostles. It took 40 authors over 1,400 years to write the 66 books we call the Bible, all originally scribed on parchment paper in very large scrolls. Second Peter chapter 1 says it this way, Above all! You must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation of things. For prophecy never had its origin in the human will. But prophets, though human, though human spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Revelation, inspiration, very short versions of these. Next is transmission. Transmission refers to the painstaking task of the individual books that were copied down to the scale and the detail of classic works of art. Those involved in this process applied so much scrutiny to ensure authenticity was being maintained that one page, one page often took several months to complete. For example, in order to check for accuracy, when a page on a scroll was completed, the middle word on a page was identified. And the middle letter of that middle word was identified. And positioning was checked against the original. And if a word on a letter did not match to that exact spot in the middle of the standard, the copy was burned and the work started over again. Today, we do not have one, not one of the original scrolls. But we do have thousands upon thousands of copies. If you compare copies we have of the New Testament with the closest book of antiquity to the New Testament, which is Homer's Iliad, the Iliad has 643 copies. There's not an original of Homer's Iliad, but there are 643 copies. Do you know how many there are of the New Testament? 24,000. The oldest known copy of the Iliad is 500 years older than the original. In history and archaeology, the closest you can get to the original, the better the verification seems to be. The closest we have to Iliad is 500 years later. The oldest copy of the New Testament that we have is less than 100 years removed from the original. Do you think God has been active in its preservation and its transmission? It's clear from these historical facts that God has overseen the handling and the care in a meticulous manner. Factor in numerous attempts at literary genocide of the Bible and its believers, governments wanting to wipe out all of its influence, our confidence only arises after an amazing amount of testing, time, energy, and divine guidance, in A.D. 400, nearly 370 years after Christ's death, the 66 books as we know them today officially came together for the first time in one cover. Brings us to phase four, translations. Revelation, inspiration, transmission, translation. Translation refers to the process where Bibles were translated from their original Hebrew in the Old Testament, Greek of the New Testament, into other languages. For us, English. And today we have a variety of translations and paraphrases of the Bible with more in process going on every single year. Many ministries are working with people groups all over the world to bring the Bible to an estimated 180 million who do not have the Scripture in their own language. To date, only 513, and this has probably changed since I read this a few months ago, of more than 7,000 languages in the world have the complete Bible in their native language. 
after investigating the origin and the processes through the history of how this special book came to us, millions of people have come to believe this is the very Word of God, and I am definitely one of those people. I wish I have time, but I do not, but I do have some copies of this sitting on the front row if somebody's that interested and want to pick it up. This is kind of a highlights of Bible translations. The first, the very first written Word of God that was published was published on Mount Sinai when God with His finger wrote in stone the Ten Commandments and gave them to Moses. So that's about 1400 B.C., Nothing else was really in printed form until about 1384, apart from the, uh, I'm talking about translations now, all right? 1384, Wycliffe is the first person to produce a handwritten manuscript, handwritten of the complete Bible, and that was in 1384. In 1455, the Gutenberg Press uh, was invented, and the first book they produced uh, was Gutenberg's Bible in Latin. Very first thing produced on the printing press. And then it's the development of um, our translations that we have. Most of us familiar with the original one that kind of impacted the world was King James in 1611. I happen to have a copy of that original 1611 on my desk. Uh, if I handed it to you, you could not read it. Mark might be the exception if he remembers Old English lettering and spelling of things, all right? But it's like a foreign language. People want to get kind of their nose in the air. I only read the original King James. No, you don't. The one you're reading today, if you have a King James, is the fourth revision. And then you get to the new King James, which is a complete new work using the same styles. There's two basic styles of translation work, one being literal, word for one, one being dynamic, thought for thought. And again, don't have time to go into all of that, but if you want a list of some of those, they're up here on the front row. Next, big concept number two. The first one was the Word of God is inspired. Number two, it is authoritative. It possesses the right to direct our lives. If the Bible was not the inspired Word of God, then it would not be the authoritative Word of God. It requires both of those. The Old Testament confirms this authoritative process of God's Word. When the psalmist wrote these, Blessed are those whose ways are blameless, who walk according to the law of the Lord. Blessed are those who keep His statutes and seek Him with all their heart. They do no wrong, but follow His ways. You've laid down precepts that are to be fully obeyed. In other words, as a Christian, you and I are not to treat the Bible as a buffet where we pick and choose what we want to read and what we want to believe and what we want to obey. Big concept number three. It's not only inspired and authoritative, it is infallible, unfailing in fulfilling its purposes. Isaiah the prophet said this, as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return to it without watering the earth and making its bud and flourish so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater, so my word that goes out of my mouth, it will not return to me empty, but it will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. What was the purpose for which he sent it? To transform your life and mine. What God says will come about will come about. What God's Word says He will do in our lives, He will do in our lives. So, all of that being said, what's the key takeaway in all this? What difference does this make in my life? Well, if we actually believe the Bible, we believe it with all of our heart and with all of our minds, then we will live differently in this world. The Bible is the lens from which the view is world. Every one of us sees the world unfold every day through a set of lenses. When we look over our shoulder, these spectacles form an image of our past. When we squint to look in front of us, these lenses give us a vision of the future. God informs. God's Word informs our thoughts and our emotions about everything that we see and experience. We see the intervention of God in history. We see God's intervention in our story. And into the future, we see as he continues to write his grand story. Number two, we are motivated and obligated to study the Bible and understand it for God's will in our own lives. The Bible says, do not be conformed by this world, but be transformed. How? By the renewing of our minds. And then we will test and prove what God's will, his good, his pleasing, and his perfect will for us. You see, 
the Bible is to be the content of truth that you and I seek to marinate our minds in. As the psalmist suggests, meditate day and night. And last of all, the principles in the Bible must govern our lives even when we don't fully understand or like what it teaches. Do you sometimes go to the Bible for direction and not like what you find? Does the fact that we don't like it give us the right? We may exercise the right to ignore it, but is it the right thing to do? It is not. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says, trust in the Lord. How? With a little bit of your heart? With all of your heart. Don't lean on your own understanding. In all of ways, submit to Him. He'll make your path straight. Soren Kierkegaard, an interesting theologian of the 20th century, early 20th century, he challenges the false fronts of a lot of Christians when he says, the Bible is not hard to understand. But we Christians, we're a bunch of scheming swindlers. We pretend to be unable to understand because we know very well that the minute we understand, we are obligated to obey. Oh, is he so right? The writer of Hebrews tells us the Bible is sharper than any two-edged sword. It penetrates even to the dividing of our soul and spirit, our joints and our moral. It judges not just our thoughts, but it brings to reality our attitudes as well. Put another way, the Word of God gets under our skin. This is not a book of suggestions. This claims to be the very Word of God, and it invites us to explore and investigate it, put our confidence in it, and let it become the rule and guide of everything that we are. So here's the question. Are you in? Are you out? Are you in the Word? Are you out? See, Scriptures are not to be emotionalized by our feelings. They are not to be rationalized by our circumstances. They are not to be influenced by the culture we live in and the times that we exist in. They are not to be politicized by politics or radicalized by our frustrations. The Word of God is to be repeatedly read, vigorously studied, often memorized, and always obeyed. The Scriptures may be debated between us to discover their deeper meanings, but they are never to be negotiated with God in a means of applying them or not applying them to our lives. The Scriptures are not the rules of a dictator. This is the loving guidance of a Heavenly Father because we have a choice. We have a choice to be in or to be out. What's your choice? Let me close with the rest of a story. I've told this story a few times through the years. I read it in a book written by Ravi Zachariah. Ravi's, Ravi's closing years in life were plagued by some sin, unfortunately. Brilliant man. Brilliant man. A powerful speaker and preacher, but it came to some point in his life where the Word of God was not as active as it should have been in his life. So I haven't told this story for a long time, but I came across a newspaper article just printed last year out of the state of Virginia, the Suffolk News Herald, where this guy I'd read about in a book written by Ravi, Hin Pham, tells his own story at a prayer breakfast just last year. And it finishes the story I had not heard. It's 1971 in Vietnam. An interpreter, Hin Phan, was raised as a devout Buddhist. One day he was given a Bible by an American soldier. And he was interested and he had questions. And then he found a Christian church that he could explain Jesus and his great love for him. Hin believed and accepted. And he became an energetic, devoted Christian. He closely worked as a translator with the American military forces as a civilian. And he knew English so well that he was able to be of immense help to them. By virtue of that same strength, he also worked with missionaries. But within four years, Vietnam fell to the communists and was arrested. He was accused of aiding and abetting the Americans. He was in and out of prison for several years. And during one long jail term, the sole purpose of the jailers was to indoctrinate him against the West and particularly against his Christian faith. He was cut off from reading anything in English and restricted to communist propaganda in French and Vietnamese. Hen began to crumble under the onslaught 
And one day he said, maybe I've been lied to. Maybe God doesn't exist. Finally, he made up his mind. He determined when he awake, awakened the next day, he would not pray anymore or think about the scriptures or his Christian faith again. The next morning, he was assigned to clean the latrines of the prison. As he cleaned out a tin can that had been stuffed with toilet paper, his eye caught what he thought was English words printed on one piece of paper. He hurriedly pulled it out and he washed it off and he slipped it into his hip pocket planning to read it that night. That night under the mosquito net in his cell, he pulled out a small flashlight and he read the top corner, Romans 8. And we know that in all things God works together for good to those who love him and trust his purposes. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? No, in all these things we can be more than conquerors. For neither death nor life nor the present nor the future nor height or depth or anything else in all of creation can separate us from the awesome love that God is in Christ Jesus our Lord. <laughs> he wept. He knew there was not a more relevant word of God of conviction and strength. For remember, he was on the verge of surrendering to the threat of evil. And he cried out to God in his cell, thanking him for his forgiveness and thanking him for the word that became alive in his heart that night. And the next day, he asked the camp commander if he could clean the latrine every day. And the commander said, sure. What Hannah had discovered is that some one of the officials in the Communist Party of the Vietnamese in his camp was using pages out of the Bible every day for toilet paper. And every day, Hen picked up a refuse-stained portion of Scripture. And he cleaned it, and he read it, and he added it to his nightly devotions. The day came when Hen was released. And he began to make plans to escape from Vietnam. This is the part of the story I didn't know before. After several unsuccessful attempts, he began to build a boat in secret. About 53 other people planned to escape with him. All was going, all was going according to plan until a short while before the date of their departure, four Viet Cong knocked on Hen's door. They accosted him and said, We've heard you're trying to escape. Is it true? And immediately denied it, distracted them with a concocted story to explain his activities. Apparently convinced they left. Hen was relieved, but then saddened and disappointed because he had lied. He prayed that the Viet Cong would come back again so he could tell them the truth. Only a few hours before they were to set sail, those four men knocked on his door one more time. We have sources. We know you're going to escape. Is it true? Hen this time, resolved to be honest, said yes. I, with 53 others, are going to try to escape. Are you going to imprison me again? Those men leaned forward and they whispered, No. We want to go with you. <laughs> Soon all 58 of them found themselves on the high seas engulfed in violent storms. As Hen concluded his story last year in Virginia, he said those four Viet Cong were all experienced fishermen, skilled sailors at handling a boat. If it were not for them being with us, we would not have made it. They arrived safely in Thailand and years later, Hen arrived in the United States, where today he's an American citizen, a successful businessman. He graduated magna cum laude from the University of California at Berkeley and with a business degree from Harvard and Stanford. Why don't we hear more about people like him from those institutions? Forever grateful to God, embracing the reality in God, I trust. So let me ask you this. Are you in? Or you out? There might be one or two of you who've come here today and you don't know Jesus. You're not even sure why you came to New Hope today. Maybe it's because you need to invite Jesus Christ in your life. You've heard enough of the dynamic word to know that Jesus Christ is a Savior and He wants to come live in your life. 
No fancy prayer. No special act you have to do. In the quietness of the closing prayer, just say, Lord Jesus, come live in my life. It's the prayer I prayed as a five-year-old boy. It's a prayer that Mark prayed back there on that side somewhere 14 years ago, 15 years ago, somewhere in that neighborhood. It's a prayer that you can pray right now. But the vast majority of you I know, and I know you're already Christians, the question I'm asking today is, have you been out? And you're ready to get in? Because this is the active word of God. And you need to be in. Let's pray. Our Father, thank you for the power of your word. It's not because it's printed on a page because it's motivated by you. It's not because it's been spoken from the lips of a a man or a woman, but it's because by that same spirit that inspired its penmanship, it now drives its points home into our heart. It's how you can take the stumbling lips of a human person and you can transform those words into a powerful truth that changes a life for all eternity. Father, is your church in the perilous times of the 21st century. We need to be men and women, boys and girls. You're never too young, never too young, you're never too old for us to be people of your word, letting it do incredible things, transforming us into the image of your dear son. Thank you, Lord, that you've heard every single prayer being shared with you at this moment. Thank you for what you're ready to do with the answer to those prayers. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. We're in this overarching theme this year of discipleship, and we've been going through a variety of different themes. And uh, as I said in the last one that we were doing on prayer, that I believe that there were two primary subjects that we should look at when it comes to discipleship. These should be the the premium subjects of the year for discipleship. The first was prayer, and we've covered that. We managed to get through that. And uh, the other one is the Bible, the Word of God. Because if we're reading God's Word and if we're speaking to God on a regular basis, then we are getting along pretty well on that road to discipleship. Now we're going to cover this other subject, the Bible, the Word of God. Prayer was one of those things that people frequently struggled with. They had trouble with it because sometimes they just couldn't find the right words. Sometimes the flow wasn't there. And other times they'd just become completely intimidated by other people who would be praying around them. And they would just pray and pray and pray. And they'd be thinking, man, I can't do that. I can't pray like that. So then they shut down and don't pray at all. Decide I'm just not going to pray out loud because it's too intimidating. Well... Hopefully by now we begin to find our voice, working through that sermon series on prayer that maybe you found a voice to speak to God on a regular basis, to communicate with Him regularly, uh, and also reading the Bible can have the same kind of effect on people. Some people, a lot of people, have trouble figuring out how to read the Bible, and so it's not surprising. It's a daunting read. There's a lot of different books in there. They're all arranged in some way. It's difficult to know where to start. And as I said before, as a kid, I've had a, I have started off with a King James Bible. That was the only Bible we had in our house. It was left over from a generation of people in my family that used to go to church. People that used to believe in God. It was the only one that we could find. It was a bit tattered, but it was a King James Version, and that was what I had to start with, so I began to read that, and frankly, it was a real struggle. I don't know if you've really spent much time reading the King James Version of the Bible. A lot of you might have it, but I'm just going to read you an excerpt, so just give you an idea, if you've never read it, as to what it sounds like. So I'm going to go in at Genesis 12. This is the story of Abram. It says, Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, 
and curse him who curseth thee, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. I mean, it's great stuff. It really is good. And, you know, we can understand what it's saying. But as a kid, I had no idea what that meant. All these, these, <laughs> these, these, all the time. As a kid, it's very distracting. Even as an adult, it can be distracting to read it like that now. So, fortunately, we have slightly easier versions just to read that read a little more smoothly than that. But this feeling of not having the ability to read the Word of God started at a very young age for me because of the version that I had. And I know for many others, it's the same thing too. And sometimes people don't feel like they can read the Word of God because it stems from different things. Some, for some people, it's just perhaps picking it up casually, reading a section of it and going, I have no idea what that means, putting it down and putting it back on the shelf. Giving up very quickly. And some people feel like their life that they lead means it's not, they're not worthy to open the Word of God. And it doesn't really look that exciting. For some people, they just look at it and go, well, that doesn't look like it's much of a riveting read. It's just a plain old book. But whatever it is, as disciples of Christ, we should be opening this book as often as humanly possible. And we started last week with this foundational side of the Word of God. Pastor Tim talked about the foundations, the basics of this book that we call the Bible. And now we're going to look at how it's broken down today. There is a danger in this that it could end up a bit like a seminary class. So I'm going to try and keep it as interesting as possible, but bear with me because you might just learn something from it. If you want somewhere to turn in your Bible today, I would suggest the table of contents. That's the easiest thing to find in the Bible. It's right at the beginning. It's just a list of all the books in the Bible. So we're going to start with some basics. We're going to look at how it's broken down. The structure of this powerful book. How is it pieced together? And why doesn't it always seem to fit very well together when we read it from beginning to end? We're going to talk about that. So here's a couple of the basics. If you look at the table of contents, the basics are that there are 66 books that make up the Bible. And it's written over a period of time, of about 1,500 years, and related to the creation all the way through to the first century. The way it was written or what it was written on was kind of relevant because what it was written on, it was illustrative of the, each of the times that it was written. It was written on things like engravings in clay, inscriptions on tablets of stone, ink and papyrus, vellum, parchment, leather, and even some soft metals. Vellum, by the way, is animal skin or membrane that's been prepared uh, that you can write on it and use it like paper. It's usually calf skin. But the original languages of the Bible are, include Hebrew, Common Greek, and Aramaic. And it has two major sections, the Old, Old Testament and the New Testament. And there's 400 years that separate the Old from the New Testament. 400 years is an interesting, 400 was kind of considered to be the perfect time. That's how people view it. There's 400 years between Old Testament and New Testament. A lot of people view that as the perfect time. It's mentioned a lot of times, 400 years. It's mentioned 400 years the Israelites were captive in Egypt. And while that didn't seem for them a particularly perfect period of time, it was the perfect amount of time for God to prepare his people for the, to be freed from that. 400 is a number that comes up in Scripture fairly frequently. It's been analyzed every which way, and I'd love to dwell on that because I actually find biblical numerology really interesting, so I'd love to get into that. But I'll make a note. We will get back to biblical numerology at some point. And some people are like, well, tell me when that is because I'm not coming. But, <laughs> but it can be really interesting as it pieces it together. But, so 400 years was the time that it, before God felt like it was time to send his son. The time for the gospels of Christ to begin and open up the New Testament. So I don't want to spoil the story or anything if you haven't read it. But anyway, uh, the Old Testament. I'm going to go through at a very brisk pace what the Old Testament is about. What are the main themes of the Old Testament? It's very brief. Quick rundown. The Old Testament is the story of God's chosen people, the Hebrews. They were later known as the Israelites or the Jews. And sometime around 1800 BC, God made a covenant with a man named Abraham uh, to escape uh, a famine... Uh, that he, no, he'd become a great nation. So he made a covenant with Abraham that all of his descendants would become a great nation. And then as time went on, the first few of these descendants eventually escaped from their own land where there was a famine. They went to Egypt. 
to escape that. And after many generations have passed and increased their numbers, they got enslaved by the Egyptians. So God then sent a great leader, Moses, to lead the Israelites out of captivity into the promised land of Canaan. And during this time, Moses received from God the Ten Commandments, which are still considered to be the basis for a moral life by both Jews and Christians alike. And in addition to the Ten Commandments, the Old Testament also lists many other laws about things like circumcision and dietary restrictions, blood sacrifices, Sabbath observance, tithing, social welfare, crimes, social behavior, armies, and qualifications of leaders, and more. But these laws regulated just about every aspect of Hebrew life at the time. And God intended for the Israelites to live according to his commandments, but also to show the truth of God to others through their actions. However, time and time again, the Israelites lost sight of this particular mission that they were given by God. They lapsed into things like idolatry. They lapsed into sin. They became very narrow-minded and selfish. They became very nationalist. They were only thinking about their own people instead of those around them. And on these occasions, God called down for them prophets. He called people to be prophets. Elijah is an example. Samuel, Jonah, Isaiah, and many others. And the idea of them, they would be a mouthpiece for God so they could get the Israelites back on track the way that God intended for them to go. The Old Testament writings had no attempt. They made no attempt at all to hide how flawed and, how fail, and, and the failings of all the leaders of the Israelites. They didn't try to cover that up. Because what they wanted to illustrate was that God uses flawed people through the Old Testament in order to accomplish his purpose. That's how powerful he is. In fact, in some ways, he wanted to use flawed people because it shows his power even more. The later Hebrew prophets foresaw the coming of the Messiah, which was the anointed one. A king who would usher in a golden era of peace and prosperity. More than any other nations, Israel now became the one that were looking forward more than anybody else. Everybody else living in the moment during that time period, but the Israelites were looking forward to the coming of the Messiah, to the fulfillment of God's promise that Abraham's descendants would become a great nation. And really, in a nutshell, that's pretty much what the Old Testament's about. I mean, yes, there's a lot more in it than that. But it all supports that underlying theme. And out of the 66 books, 39 of them are in the Old Testament. And the 39 books of the Old Testament, if you look at them in your table of contents, <clears throat> can be, essentially be broken into four major categories. The four major categories are these. The first one is the book of law. The books of the law, the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy are the first five books, and that is the books of the law, also known as the Pentateuch or the Torah, but essentially the books of the law, and they're written by Moses, and they describe from creation through the point when the Israelites were ending their uh, wandering around in the wilderness, when they were getting ready to go into Canaan, the land, uh, the promised land. So that's the first five books, first section, pretty simple. The next ones are the historical books, and it starts at Joshua and ends in Esther. Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 1st, 2nd Samuel, 1st, 2nd Kings, 1st, 2nd Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther. Those are the historical books of the Israelites. That is for the history of the nation of Israel, described from the conquest of the promised land all the way through to Israel's restoration after the Babylonian captivity. That's the history right there. So you can see it all goes in order, makes it easy. Then we get to the poetical books. They're called the poetical books or the books of everyday wisdom or the writings, depending on where you read it. But those are the next five books. Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Song of Solomon. The poetical books. Then the prophetic books. And you could break this into two. So some people say the Old Testament is broken into five sections. Well, the fourth one really is the prophetic books. These are the prophets, major and minor. Those are the subcategories. And when you think about major and minor, so the major prophets are Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, and Daniel. So when you think about the major prophets, don't think about baseball. Major prophets are not better, more quality, significantly increased in, in value. They just have longer books. 
than the minor prophets. That's it. It's nothing to do with quality. It's just to do with quantity. So, um, so the, the rest of them, all the way through the end of the Old Testament, are the minor prophets. So starting at Hosea and going through Malachi, those are the minor prophets. So that's it. That's the Old Testament in a nutshell as far as how it's structured together. It's simple. But you, all you have to really remember is these four sections. The law, the history, the poetry, and the prophecy. Not chronologically put into the Bible. And this is where people get unglued with this because they, they start reading the Bible at the beginning, they get through and they're going... Well, that didn't make any sense in the Old Testament. They go, that doesn't make any sense. Because there were stories that seemed to be repeated later on, but it's because they're not chronologically put together. It would look a lot different if everything was put together in the time period that it happened. And also, <clears throat> if you want to see that, there is this book, which is called The Story. We did this about 10 years ago. It was introduced about 10 years ago. We did it here as a study, and uh, we went through this, uh, this version of the Bible, which is done in chronological order, and it's really, really helpful to understand how all of this comes together, how the story of the Bible all unfolds. And it has Scripture references throughout it, so you can, you can go to Scripture and see where it is that it's uh, being referenced, that, that particular part of the story. But it really helped me immensely when it came to how the order of things were put together in the Bible chronologically. The subtitle of this, of this uh, version of the Bible is, The Bible as One Continuing Story of, of God and His People. So it's written chronological, chronological order. It really helped me immensely. I would recommend it because it, it, for me, it really opened my eyes and, and revealed to me exactly what the story of God's people was. So uh, the arrangement of the New Testament, so that's the Old Testament. The arrangement of the New Testament is just as simple. If you break it down, it opens up with the four Gospels, and that's the Gospel section, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The same uh, story, but through the lenses of four different men. Therefore, it shows slightly different perspective, different emphasis, and it's often determined, the emphasis in each of the Gospels is often determined by who it is that they were writing it for, who was the audience that they were expecting to read this. For example, Matthew was clearly writing to the Jewish Christians, the people that had been established in the Jewish community who had come across the way or the teachings of Jesus, the early church, and they had become Christians. These were the type of people that Matthew was talking to. Matthew's gospel is described as the most Jewish of all gospels, whereas Luke's, Luke's primary audience was the Gentiles, the non-Jews. So when you look at the four gospels, you think, well, maybe this is overkill. This is the same story, just repeated four times in different ways, or some things were not done, done in one versus another, but so you think it's overkill. There certainly can be different perspectives that can be pulled for all four of them, and they look at things with a slightly different emphasis, but together they form a very complete portrait of the man of Jesus. They complete this portrait of his life and his ministry here on earth. So after the Gospels, we see the book of Acts, Acts of the Apostles. Now Acts picks up where the Gospels left off. It's just one book. It's not short, but it's one and this literally acts as, acts, acts as a backbone for almost the rest of the New Testament. So Acts is the historical portion. You've got the Gospels, then you've got the history. Same thing as in the Old Testament. You've got the history. So now we have the history of the early church. Acts, is, that's exactly what that was. The history of the early church started by the disciples of Christ. Christ left. He left the Holy Spirit to empower these men to start the early church. And this is the history of how that went. So the rest of the New Testament, except for Revelation, really is all the letters that are wrapped up around that story of the early church. Letters from men, mostly Paul, but they were intimately involved in the structure and the development of the early church. And just as the Old Testament could be broken up into four parts, so can the New Testament. So in the Old Testament, you've got the law, history, poetry, and prophecy. And in the New Testament, you've got the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You've got the history, which is the Acts of the Apostles. Then you've got the letters, which is all the rest of them except for Revelation. And then Revelation is the prophecy. So Gospel, history, um, letters, and prophecy. And again... This all makes it seem a lot less daunting if you break it down into chunks like that. And it helps make a little more sense. Uh, 
So if you look at the book of Acts, and we're going to be looking at Acts a lot more in detail next year as we get into this next uh, sort of theme of the missional church next year, we'll be looking at Acts. But Acts has this sort of timeline of all the stories that happened in the amazing history of the church. And you can see all the letters that get written, specifically by Paul, in the New Testament that occur in the timeline of Acts. So Acts begins, and this starts the history of the church, and throughout the history of the church and Paul's travels, he writes these letters in between. That's why it acts as a backbone for all these letters that we read uh, in the New Testament. So really the rest of it is just, the rest of the New Testament up to Revelation is seeing how Acts plays out in the letters and, uh, and how the development of the early church plays out in the letters. But how are these letters arranged? Well, the letters of Paul come first. Not for another reason, it just seemed convenient. It's not because he was you know, better than any of the others. It's just Paul comes first. And Paul wrote different letters. He wrote some letters to the church. He wrote some letters to individuals. All the church letters come first, longest to shortest. Then all the individual letters come next. And then named after the people he sent them to. Later on, letters are named after the people who sent them. But for Paul, it's the people he sent them to. Like Timothy, we looked at earlier this year. It was sent to Timothy. So, so first of all, the letters to the church. Then Paul's letters to the people, individuals. Then the next category after that is the general letters. Those are other people's letters. These eight letters were written uh, by various authors, authors. And except for Hebrews, they're named after the people who actually wrote them. They're not organized chronologically or by importance. Generally, it's longest to shortest, except for Peter and John, where they're bunched together. So, no particular order. So, just keep that in mind um, when you think about uh, how those are arranged. And then the final one in Revelation. This is the prophecy of the New Testament. So, we have prophecies of the Old Testament, prophecies of the New Testament now. These are things that are still yet to come. So think about the prophecies of the Old Testament. They were all fulfilled when it came to Jesus Christ. So what is, what, why would we think any different when it comes to the prophecy in the New Testament? Jesus will come again. And there's lots of iterations of how it's going to happen. However, ultimately, the bottom line is that Jesus Christ will return, and he will return as a conquering king. So that's how the Bible's organized. That's a quick, fast, and furious lesson on how it's structured. Does that make any more sense? You probably think, I already knew this. I don't know why you're telling us all this stuff. But anyway, hopefully you learned something out of that process about how it's put together. But in order, um, but in order to understand and fully benefit from the Word of God, we have to remember that despite what order it's in and all the rest of it, it has to be in context. Scripture needs to be in context. It's very important because if we take it out of context then it can change what it is that it's trying to tell us. It can change the whole point of what Scripture is there for in the first place. And I don't know if you've ever done this thing where you randomly pick a verse and you think to yourself, I don't know where to start reading in my Bible today, so I'm just going to randomly pick a spot and start reading for a couple of verses. See what it is that God wants to say to me today. Has anyone done that? I mean, I think everybody at some point has done it. Well, if you pick stuff out of context, or if you only pick up two verses and then you don't look at what the context is in it, it can give you a completely different meaning to what you expected it. It could give you a completely different impression of the person that it's talking about. I'm just going to give you some examples of what could happen if you do that. If you were to randomly open your Bible and end up in 1 Kings, 20, uh, 1 Kings 2, 23 and 24, and you think to yourself, these two verses today are going to be my verses for the day. I'm going to learn what God is going to tell me from this. And it says, from there, Elisha went up to Bethel. And he was walking along the road. Some boys came out of the town and jeered at him. Get out of here, Baldy. They said, get out of here, Baldy. He turned around, looked at them, called down a curse on them in the name of the Lord. Then two bears came out of the woods and mauled 42 of the boys. Those are your verses for the day. That's a bit out of context. It's hard to learn very much from that other than Elisha, a great prophet, was also a bit of a, an angry bald man with a lot of power that he seemed to misuse sometimes. That's what you can pull out of that because there's no context to it. Or if you were to randomly eat, read Acts 20 verse 9 about Paul, and it was said, seated in a window was a young man named Eutychus who was sinking into a deep sleep as Paul talked on and on. 
And when he was sound asleep, he fell to the ground from the third story and picked up dead. So what you get from that is that Paul was literally boring people to death. His preaching was going on so long, people were falling asleep, and they were sitting in windows, so they were falling out of the windows and dying. But in context, it changes it. Paul was in Troas. He had a lot to say. He was leaving the next morning. He decided to pull an all-nighter and preach all the way through the night because he felt like it was important to talk to the people there, and he couldn't help it if one of the guys couldn't handle this all-nighter and fell asleep in the window and fell out. He did bring him back to life. Judges is another one. Man, you could pick a bunch of them in Judges. But Judges 7, if you randomly open your Bible, got to Judges 7, verses 5 and 6, and you read, So Gideon took the men down to the water. There the Lord told him, Separate those who lap the water with their tongues as a dog laps from, the, uh, from those who kneel down to drink. 300 of them drank from cupping hands, like lapping like dogs. All the rest got down on their knees to drink. And in, out of context, you look at that, I think it's a very odd way to lead people. It's a really odd way to select people by the way that they drink from water. But it was God's, in context, it's God's way of, of dwindling down the number of Gideon's army so that God could show his power in the battle by having such a small army of Gideon uh, against such a large army that when he won, it could only be explained by God. But out of context, it just sounds weird. I won't even get into the tent peg through the head. That one is out of context, is a little scary. But anyway, <clears throat> but so context is really important when it comes to reading scripture. But there's more to it even than that. The most important thing to know about scripture is that all the way through this book, all the way through it, is a thread that connects it all together. And it's been referred to, this thread, as the scarlet thread because it is the thread of sacrificial blood. It starts with creation at the very beginning. This thread, the scarlet thread, starts at creation uh, and it goes all the way through to the empty tomb. And I came, speaking of the empty tomb, I did come across this interesting story which I had to share with you this morning. It's a story set back in the 1960s. Nikita Khrushchev was the secretary of the Communist Party in the Soviet Union. And in one infamous speech, he declared the superiority of communism against the Americans by saying, we will bury you. It was ironic because when he died in 1971, the Soviets wouldn't even bury him in the Soviet Union. They wanted to bury him somewhere else. They just didn't want him there anymore. He'd fallen out of favor with the Soviet Union, which was not difficult to do at those times. You just look at them sideways wrong. But still, he had fallen out of favor. So the Russians or the Soviets called up the Americans and asked if they would take Khrushchev's body and bury him here in the United States. Nixon said, no, we politely decline. In desperation, the Soviet officials asked then the Israeli prime minister, Golda Meir, if they could send Khrushchev's body over to be buried in Israel. Golda Meir agreed, but then she added to it, however, I must warn you that Israel has the highest resurrection rate. <laughs> and, it, and it still does. The tomb is still empty, still has the same resurrection rate. Those of us heading to the Holy Land next year will confirm that for you, but I don't think it needs a lot of confirmation. So the empty tomb, it goes from creation to the empty tomb. That is the scarlet thread. <clears throat> W.A. Criswell was a longtime uh, pastor of First Baptist Church in Dallas. And on New Year's Eve in 1961, Dr. Criswell preached a five-hour message tracing this theme of the blood of the Lamb through every book of the Bible. I'm not going to do that today. But what I do want to do, the second part of this, is to illustrate what that looks like. So here's a quick quote from Dr. Criswell's introduction to that five-hour sermon. Did you know that a scarlet thread winds its way throughout the entire Bible? Skeptics and scoffers may fire their arrows at the validity and history of the scriptures, but believers throughout the centuries have seen the, this line of crimson weaving through every book of God's holy word. It is the story of redemption of mankind at the price of the blood of Jesus Christ. So that's kind of the theme. And the key verse for understanding this scarlet thread that goes throughout the word of God is 
uh, Hebrews 9.22. Hebrews 9.22 says, In fact, the law requires that nearly everything be cleansed with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. That's the key point. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. This is a driving principle that runs throughout the entire Bible. We don't understand why the blood sacrifice leads to forgiveness. We don't have to understand why it leads to forgiveness. God told us in the Bible that's what it was going to do. Therefore, we just need to understand that that's what happens. We don't understand how a brown cow can eat green grass and make white milk, right? But it does. It doesn't matter how. The Chinese girl from an underground church, however, in China, risked her freedom and potentially her life every Sunday to go to an underground church in China. And when she was asked why she wanted to do this, she said, I don't want to go to church just to hear the message that we should be nice to one another. She said, I need to know why Jesus Christ died. I just need to know why Jesus Christ died. And in the Bible, there is this recurring pattern that reveals the necessity of a blood sacrifice, and that is the scarlet thread. The first time we see the scarlet thread is in Genesis. Genesis chapter 3, verse 21, it says, The Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. So we discover there's a big difference between Uh, fig leaf clothing and animal skin clothing. The first recorded death in the Bible was an animal that was killed to clothe Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve lived in the Garden of Eden, this paradise. And when they disobeyed God, their eyes were opened up and they realized that they were naked. They felt a totally new emotion, shame. They'd never felt it before. But we've all been feeling it ever since that time. And in their attempt to cover up that shame that they felt, the Bible says they wove together some fig leaves. Uh, They were creative. They probably thought they looked pretty good at that point. But but God came along. He came looking for them. They were hiding even from God. But he came looking for them. He found them. He looked at them. And he's like, I'm going to spill some blood. I'm going to kill an animal in order to make you a different set of clothing. He could easily have created clothing out of nothing. He can create man out of the dust. Why couldn't he create clothing out of nothing? But he didn't. He killed an animal, sacrificed an animal to take their skin in order to give them clothing. Clothing. Why? Because it was a blood sacrifice for their sin. The first one, a blood sacrifice for their sin. Because without the shedding of blood, there isn't forgiveness. It doesn't say what kind of animal was in the garden. It doesn't say what kind of animal was killed in order to give them this skin. I'm sure when we get to heaven, we'll find out exactly what animal it was, but I like to think it might have been a lamb. It might have been a lamb. And so begins the thread of scarlet. The second time we see this is in the story of Cain and Abel. Cain bought an offering of plants because he was a farmer. He bought an offering of plants to God. Abel was a shepherd, so he brought a sacrifice from his flock before God. And in Genesis 4.4, it says, God accepted Abel's offering, but not Cain's. Pretty sure most people here can agree with God on that. We're a very meat-loving church here. So if someone brought you an offering of vegetables, you're probably like, mm, you got any meat? And that was kind of where God was at this point. He's like, no. The vegetables, the fruit, it's not enough. I need to have the blood sacrifice. Why? Because plants don't bleed. And without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness. You might think that's unfair of God to choose Abel's sacrifice. After all, Cain was a farmer. He was working hard. He was giving a portion of what he had got, what he had grown. He was giving it to God as a sacrifice. But you can assume that Adam had already told him what the rules of sacrifice are, that there needs to be a blood sacrifice. But Cain basically said, I don't want anything to do with the blood sacrifice, so I'll just substitute blood for fruit. There are many people today that react the same way. In the Christian faith, some people say, I don't want anything to do with this idea of the blood of the lamb. In fact, there was a mainstream denomination years ago that intentionally went through all their hymnals and removed any song that related to the blood of Jesus. I guess it made them too squeamish. I see this idea of blood all the time. But it is the key to forgiveness. The next place we see the scarlet thread is in the the story of Abraham and Isaac. The blood of the ram substituted for the blood of a son. Abraham only had one son, and as a test, God asked Abraham to go and sacrifice that son. 
So Abraham took Isaac up Mount Moriah. Uh, they probably made sacrifices there before. And as they walked up, Isaac was probably puzzled. He was asking Abraham, when, where's the lamb for the burnt offering? And Abraham's like, don't worry. God will provide for the sacrifice. Isaac didn't know he was supposed to be the sacrifice. But as Abraham was preparing to plunge the knife into his son in order to sacrifice him to God, God stopped him and said, don't. Don't harm the boy. Now I know that you fear me because you are willing to give up your only son. And in Genesis 22, 13, the Bible says that there was a ram that was caught in the thicket, a thicket of thorns, and Abraham sacrificed it instead of his son. Mount Moriah, Mount Calvary, they're in the same area. Some people say they're the same mountain. But centuries after Abraham and Isaac walked up Mount Moriah, the Lord Jesus Christ was our ram caught in a thicket, a thicket of a crown of thorns. And as our substitute, he walked up the hill, either the same hill or the adjacent one, but this time he was carrying a cross. Next, a scarlet thread was seen in the Passover. The blood of the lamb shielded the Israelites from judgment. So we fast forward now from the time of Abraham to the time of uh, where the children of Israel were captive in Israel. God sent Moses to Pharaoh to set his people free and, and Pharaoh refused. Even after God had set a series of plagues and a series of different events upon the land. <clears throat> and finally, God announced that he was going to have one final judgment on, the, on Egypt during that time. And usually when God pronounces judgment... He also gives a way to escape from that judgment as well. So he instructed the Israelite families that they were to take a lamb, take a lamb that was without spot, without blemish, a perfect lamb, and they were to take the blood from the lamb, they would put it on the doorposts and above the door, uh, around the, in their houses, and then they were to roast the lamb and enter into the house and eat it. And then in Exodus 12 it says, and on that same night... I will pass through Egypt and strike down the firstborn, and I will bring judgment upon all the gods of Egypt. I am the Lord. The blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are, and when I see the blood, I will pass over you. No destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. That's why it's called the Passover. He passed over the Israelites who had the blood on the door, and when God saw the blood, his judgment passed over those families. This scarlet thread continues to weave throughout time but it is headed for a specific destination. Because next we see it in the temple sacrifice. This is more of a general thing in the Old Testament. The blood of the animals that took away their sin. Fast forward from Moses to a time when the Jews now have built a temple on Mount Moriah in Jerusalem. And every day hundreds and hundreds of animals were sacrificed at the temple. And this was blood shed for the forgiveness of God's people. And this went on for a long, long time. So we could trace the scarlet thread running through every other part of the Old Testament, but now we'll fast forward to the conclusion of the scarlet thread. Where is the conclusion? Because it's the point that God is really trying to make. The scarlet thread leads to the cross. When John the Baptist was preaching in the desert, he saw Jesus walking towards him. And in John 1.29, he makes one of the most important identification in the history of the world. Some people say back then that Jesus was a prophet people were saying he's just a healer but John the Baptist knew the true identity of God and in, in uh, John 1 he says look the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world John announced to the world that Jesus was the completion of this scarlet thread and with Abraham and Isaac it was just one lamb for one son for the people of the Israelites who were escaping Egypt it was one lamb for one family but now John has announced that Jesus is the Lamb of God for the entire world. You've probably heard of the guy Ivan Pavlov. You know, in science class, you learn about Pavlov and how he did this conditional experiment, or these uh, psychological experiments, uh, the conditioning experiments. And he had a group of dogs, Pavlov's dogs, and so he would feed them after he rang a bell. So he'd ring the bell, feed them, 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 ring the bell not feed them. What's going to happen? They begin to salivate anyway, because now they think they're going to get fed. They've conditioned them to hear the bell and think they're going to get fed. But that's exactly why God led the nation of Israel to offer sacrificial lamb over all of those centuries. He was conditioning them for the day that John the Baptist would say, Behold the Lamb of God to take away the sin of the world. 
And if Israel had been paying attention, then they would have said, oh yeah, now we get it. We understand now. But they were so consumed by their own religion. They were so consumed by what things they needed to do in order to please God that they missed God's point completely. And the Bible says in John 1.11 that Jesus came to that which were his own, the Jewish people, but his own did not receive him. The cross of Jesus was not just some afterthought for God. It wasn't plan B because plan A was just going horribly wrong. It was God's plan from the very beginning. In Revelation 13, 8, it says Jesus, it identifies Jesus as the lamb that was slain from the creation of the world. And before God hung up the stars, before God piled up the mountains, before God scooped out the oceans, he planned for the lamb of God to die on the cross for you and for me. Why? Because that was the final sacrifice. The death on the cross allowed us to be redeemed from this life. 1 Peter 1, 18, 19 says, For you know that it was, not, uh, it was not with perishable things, such as silver and gold, that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. And as disciples of Christ... We accept that our sin has been washed away by this blood sacrifice and we don't have to perform this ritualistic sacrifices all the time anymore and that we can have eternal life through our acceptance of the one who made it possible, Jesus Christ. This thread that runs through the word of God and ultimately ends up at the cross is one that brings us closer to God. It brings us into a more intimate relationship with God. In Ephesians, Paul writes, But now in Christ Jesus, the, you were, who once were far have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Brought near to God by the blood of Christ, which was the end of the scarlet thread. One Easter morning, Pastor A.J. Gordon who's a well-known Baptist preacher in the 1800s. He was surprised his congregation when he came in and he put on the pulpit a rusty old cage uh, that was empty and the door was open. He told the congregation a story about meeting a dirty-faced little boy from the slums who had a bird cage filled with frightened sparrows that he'd trapped. Dr. Gordon asked him what he was planning to do with the birds and the little boy just scowled at him and said, oh, I like poking them with a stick, watching them flutter around, and when I'm finished with them, I guess I'm just going to kill them. So Dr. Gordon said, would you let me buy those birds? The boy just said, mister, you don't want these birds. They're not worth anything. They're just old field sparrows. Dr. Gordon said, I'll give you $5 for the cage and all the birds. The kid's eyes lit up, five whole dollars. So he said, sure. The boy walked off laughing at his new riches and Dr. Gordon then walked to the park and opened the door of the cage. And the, At first, the sparrows just huddled together in the cage till he tapped the bottom a bit and then gradually, one by one, they would go to the door, they'd open their wings and then they would take off into freedom. They chirped their way as they flew away and Dr. Gordon said the birds circling in the sky, it was as if they were singing, redeemed, redeemed, redeemed. We can get stuck in a cage. And Satan is happy to poke at us, to watch us flutter around, to try and fix all the things in our lives on our own to see how that works out, but it never gets us out of the cage. But when we accept Jesus Christ, when we accept the freedom that comes from this scarlet thread, then we are redeemed. We are forgiven because in the blood there is forgiveness. We're free from our sins because of the blood that was, skilled, that was spilled. The word of God is just that powerful. The word of God is sending this, uh, this message. Yes, it's broken up into sections. It's organized in a different way just to help us to understand how it is. But ultimately, there is a message of the scarlet thread that runs all the way through this. And it's God's way of showing us his immense and inexhaustible love. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we give thanks for your word. We're grateful for the message that you are portraying throughout this whole book so that we can understand not just the history, not just the poetry, not just the gospels and the story of Christ, but ultimately the message that runs deep down underneath that. And that is your story of redemption for us.
the blood that is shed from beginning to end and ultimately the blood of your own son so that we can have the forgiveness of our sins, so that we can have the freedom of being redeemed through him. Lord, we thank you for your son. But most of all, open our eyes and open our heart to open this book and understand what you're saying to us. We are grateful for your love. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Have a wonderful week. Awesome. Thank you, Morgan. Thank you, team. Church, good morning. How are you guys doing today? It's good. I'm sweating a little less, so that's always a win for me. Um, thank you, Morgan. Um, she feels me on that on a spiritual level. Uh, well, today is a very good day indeed, not just weather-wise. Um, and I'm actually really excited about where we're going today. Um, as you kind of know, the key that we're in right now for unlocking discipleship is Bible study, right? The Word of God. And all of our keys are really important when thinking about discipleship, all the ones that we have been going through, the ones that we still have yet to come the rest of this year. Um, but this one in particular is really exciting because it is the only one where we can say that we are actually reading the actual words of God, right? These, this is as believers in this church, we believe that the Bible is God-breathed, as 2 Timothy chapter 3 says, that all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Like, this is the main tool that we get to use for teaching other people about God, for rebuking them or really correct, criticizing someone's behavior if it's poor or ungodly, correcting them and then training them how to follow Christ better. Not only that, this verse affirms that God himself is the one that is breathing through these words through the writers of the Bible itself, that it is all from him that these are happening. And we actually get to be able to read the voice of God, right? That's so exciting. But for some, that's not necessarily the case. Some, some people don't believe that, or don't trust really, that the Bible is God's actual words. Don't, don't trust what Christians have been saying for a long, long time. So with that, let me ask you a question. Have any of you ever watched the movie Galaxy Quest? You want to got two people? Okay. It's not as familiar. How about this one? Have any of you ever seen the movie The Three Amigos? We are the three amigos. Remember that movie? Yeah? It's great, thank you. These are, both of those movies are movies I grew up watching with my dad. Gianna's super embarrassed by me right now, and that's great. Love that. Um, but when is she not? So, um, But The Three Amigos was made in 1986, I believe, 85, 86. And Galaxy Quest was made in 1999. And what's so hilarious to me is the amount of story connections and similarities that are between the two movies. So I'm going to describe the three amigos since that's one that's more familiar. And for those that don't know, I'm going to kind of talk about what this movie is about. So the three amigos centers around these three characters. We got Lucky Day, Dusty Bottoms, and Ned Nedelander. Great names. All three played by Steve Martin, Chevy Chase, and Martin Short. And these three characters are in this popular television show called The Three Amigos. And this was a story about, it was a Western kind of, uh, it was a Western about these bandit fighters. Um, and they have a long history of playing these three beloved characters. But as time kept going on and on and on, their relevance became less and less and less. And so on the verge of not having any more work to do because it was a less relevant TV show, they get a letter from this small church in, Me or small church, small village in Mexico saying, hey, we need you here to come and, and help us. And they're like, awesome, this is fantastic. We got work. The catch is, is that the three amigos believe that this is actually an acting gig that they're going to be going to go asked to do to come work with this guy named El Guapo and to put on a show for this small village in Mexico. And they're, you know, they're willing because, you know, they're in need of some work. But what they don't realize is that this is actually 
real. So they eventually find out later, rather than sooner, that El Guapo is not an actor, that he is actually a terrible bandit trying to terrorize this little village. And these villagers were seeking their help to actually fight a real bad guy. And so at some point, Lucky, Dusty, and uh, Ned have to then tell the village, hey, like, this isn't what we do. Like, we're actors, we're performers, we're, we're fakes. And when they tell the village this, the entire village is absolutely crushed. Because what they thought that was going to happen, they, they saw these people on the television thinking, these were our saviors. These were the people that were going to help us fight off El Guapo. Turns out it was a whole lie. Now, Galaxy Quest, on the other hand, is kind of like the same thing, except a small village in Mexico is some aliens and a spaceship, and then El Guapo would be like a bigger, badder alien. Um, so 10 out of 10 would recommend you go watch either of those. They're hilarious movies. But what's interesting to me is that there are people out there in the world who kind of think of God in the same way. Maybe once they thought God was this hero type of being that they can come to, but then have been disappointed by the way people have treated them, the way that the church has treated them, or so on. And there's other people who used to maybe think that the Bible was truly God's word, but you know, are discouraged because they've seen some errors or they've seen some um, contradictions on their own time or they've heard it from other people. So for today, what we're actually going to do is we're going to be taking a look at some of those things that seem like contradictions in the Bible or things that people claim to be contradictions through the lens of three different factors that are important when we do study our Bible. And those three factors are this, doing effective research, understanding the narrative motivation, and trusting God and his word. Now for myself, what we're going to go through is super fascinating information for me. And so I hope that I can boil this down without being too exhausting. So this is my warning. We're going to be in the classroom for a little bit. So put on your classroom hats. If you do need to fall asleep, I get it. I fell asleep all the time when I was in college in classes like that. So just know I'll be judging you um, from this stage. Uh, I will see you and hopefully not hear you snore. Unless you brought your CPAP machine with you in church, then that's a whole nother story. I couldn't do that. It's too, actually mine's really quiet, but that's another story. Anyways, so hang out with me for a little bit. We're going to go into the classroom and do some learning. The first thing, right, the first factor that we're going to do is doing effective research. Last week, Pastor Tim actually gave us three questions to ask when we are, as the way Tim put it, when you and God are having your divine romance which is a very eloquent and nice way of putting it. Um, but essentially, when we are studying God's word, there's three questions. There's what, so what, and now what, right? The what question is, uh, what does this passage mean in the context of which it was written? Which is a great question to ask. Um, so who wrote it? Who is it written to? And what was the purpose of it being written at that time? The so what is for the application of the passage that you are reading and how that principle applies to your life. And then the now what is asking the question of what difference should this make in your life now having studied it? Now, the first, um, we're going to take a look now at the first contradiction that people may think is in the Bible. Um, we're also going to be jumping around in the Bible a little bit. So think of it as kind of like a sword drill, if you will. So the first one we're going to look at is Genesis 3, which should be pretty easy to find. You just whew, right to the beginning move over a couple pages, but we're going to be in Genesis chapter 3, and we're going to look at this with the understanding of doing effective research and how it better understands this contradiction. Genesis chapter 3, verse 14 says this, so the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and all wild animals. You will crawl on your belly and you will eat dust all the days of your life. You'll eat dust all the days of your life. Now, I don't know much about snake biology, um, but I don't think snakes actually eat dust, right? Um, that's one of the contradictions is people will say, well, it says snakes eat dust, so um, obviously the Bible's wrong. And I'm like, well, that's a little presumptuous, but because I know I've seen snakes eat like mice, other lizards, I've seen them eat eggs. Heck, I've even seen them eat like whole human beings and like alligators. Have you seen those videos? Just me watching the weird ones on YouTube where they're like cutting open a snake and it's like, Wah! gross. There's fun videos on YouTube. You can look it up later if you want. Um, 
But some people in the world will look at this story and they'll think that maybe the Bible uh, has an error in it because, of course, snakes don't actually eat dust, right? And to normal people who don't know much about snake biology, you think, okay, maybe, maybe we've got something going on here and we'll wonder what this passage is actually saying. Like, we'll get visual for a second. Like, what do snakes look like when they're on the ground? They like slithering around, sticking their tongue out. Mm-hmm. I'm not, I'm not going to get on the ground because the people in the back row won't be able to see, and that's just not fair. Um, so I'm not going to go too visual, but yeah, it kind of looks like they're eating dust, right? Like when they stick their tongue out, and it's like going all over the place. But if you do some research, do a little bit of digging in there, you'll find out that this action for the snake of kind of sticking their tongue out and wiggling it around actually does serve a purpose because in the mouth of a snake in the top of it, there's this little organ called the Jacobson's organ. And what happens is as the snake sticks its tongue out, it kind of brushes up against anything that's around it or in front of it. And as it sticks the tongue back into its mouth, uh, the, the front of the tongue goes into that organ and it picks up whatever like particles and things are, were picked up by the tongue and it kind of acts like a nose for the snake. And so when it's like crawling over the dirt, it's kind of like whoosh, whoosh, whipping over some dust and it pulls it back in its mouth. So it's kind of like it's eating dust a little bit, right? In a fun, weird science biology kind of way, like it's kind of like that. We can also find with a fun little Google search is that this idea of being on your belly and crawling on the ground or being low to the ground um, kind of like a a creature, is depicting this idea of being low, despicable, abhorrent, or degraded. You know, it's, it's not a good thing for you to be low to the earth. Like, it's seen like that. You can see an image of this in Micah chapter 7, uh, where it mentions that the nations of Israel, or the nations around the world, are going to be looking upon Israel and being embarrassed um, or being ashamed by the might that, that they have. And it says, they shall eat Uh, They shall lick the dust like a serpent. They shall crawl from their holes like snakes of the earth. So we definitely get this sense like "Eh, it's not a good thing to be crawling and licking the dust. But isn't that fascinating? Like something that we read in the Bible, we can actually get a good understanding of when we do our effective research, right? We can understand that there's actually a deeper meaning behind what is being said, even by a simple Google search. But isn't that great? Look at us. We're learning. Ha! School. It's great. But let's take another look at a different contradiction that people have said. The next one is in Genesis chapter 1 and 2. Um, If you look at those, it's like one page back, which is great. Um, But in Genesis 1 and 2, we get the creation accounts that are written about, right? The contradiction that people say is that Uh, there's two different creation accounts. Because if you look at Genesis 1, it says that man and woman were created at the same time, but it was after the animals. But Genesis chapter 2 says that the animals were created after the humans. So Genesis 1, animals, or humans after animals. Genesis 2, animals after humans. So um, what I want to do now is uh, we're going to look at Genesis 2, 19. And normally when I read scripture, from the stage here, it's usually the NIV, but what I, what's interesting is I want to look at the New King James Version real quick, um, and so I'm going to read that for us right now. The New King James Version of Genesis 2.19 says, Out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the air and brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. And whatever Adam called them, called the living creatures, that was its name. So in reading that, you're like, okay, yeah, I could see that. You know, Adam was already there. Then God made the creatures, showed them to Adam. He said, you are giraffe. And they went on their way, and it was great. But the NIV, when you read that, it looks slightly different, right? Um, Let me read to you the NIV. Now, the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the wild animals and all the birds of the sky. He brought them to the man to see what he would name them, and whatever the man called each living creature, that's that's what its name was. Oh man, reading's hard. But do you notice the difference? The New King James says just formed. The NIV says had formed. The second suggests that animals were being brought to Adam had already been made. And the reason why is that when you do a little bit of research and look into the Hebrew word formed that was used in this passage specifically, 
It actually is what's called the pluperfect tense of that word. It's a big fancy word that means that it gives the implication that it was already made. So the thing being referenced, so the story being told, let's start there. The story being told of the animals coming to Adam, the animals were already formed before that moment. So it helps us kind of understand a little bit of what's actually being said when you can do your research and look into even the specific words that were being said. Because then we get a little bit more understanding. In the same way, had the aliens in Galaxy Quest actually done their research a little bit more, they would have known that these people that they were bringing up into their spaceship to fight the big bad alien are actually just television actors and have no idea what they're doing. And they would have saved themselves a ton of heartache. But do your research, right? It's a good thing. The next factor that we're going to look into is understanding the narrative motivation. So what's kind of fun is that Pastor Mark a couple weeks ago actually brought up this idea um, in his message when he was preaching on, um, what was it, the structure and the context of the Bible. But what he brought up was that, and what we're going to look at today is the perspective of each gospel writer. So the gospel of Matthew, when Matthew is writing, his specific goal was to write to the Jews specifically. And he was writing to them to try to convince them that Jesus was actually the fulfillment of everything that happened in the Old Testament. Now Mark, on the other hand, he was trying to answer the question of who Jesus is. Who is this Jesus guy? Which, fascinating enough, Um, that question doesn't even get answered until the very end of the gospel when a Roman centurion finally says, you are the son of God. Now in Luke's gospel, he is asserting that Jesus is king. And so his focus is more on the kingship and laws and rules and things that must be followed. And then lastly, John, who's kind of doing his own little thing, he's more covering the topic of Jesus is divine. He's divine. He's heavenly. And so it's fascinating. The way that Pastor Mark described it two weeks ago was that all four of these gospels are working together to give you a, a fuller and a, a more complete picture of who Jesus is. You can think about it this way. Let's say there's a young kid getting bullied at school. It's not great. His older brother finds out about this, and so he decides to step in. And unfortunately for the older brother, this results in the bully and the older brother getting into a fight. Now, they both get in trouble. They both get sent home. But in the retelling of this story, you might hear from the younger brother talking about how heroic and how brave and how powerful and strong that the older brother was to fight off this bully. And you might hear from the bully, uh, the bully's parents saying that, no, the real bully is the, the older brother. He's the one that stepped in and fought my son. But you might also hear from some random bystanders how strong and how uh, muscular or whatever that the older brother is. And you might hear from the parents of the two siblings, you might hear from them saying how brave and how caring and kind that the older brother was for being able to step in on behalf of his younger brother. Now you're hearing the same story. It's the same situation playing out, but now you're getting a bigger picture and a better understanding of who the older brother was in connection to all these other different pieces that were at play. So understanding Matthew's perspective now and the motivation behind the way that he writes will help us understand another contradiction that some people have claimed, or at least this is one that I've heard very recently. This contradiction comes from the book of Matthew between the chapters 14 and 15. So if you do have your Bible and you want to look there, we're gonna, not going to be reading so much as kind of glancing through it. But if you'd like to, that's where we'll be. Now, as you're looking at that, um, these stories that we're looking at, you'll be familiar with, are going to be the feeding of the 5,000 and the feeding of the 4,000. The thought that I've heard is that you know, the gospel writer Matthew was, there's a ton of information that was being spread around there at this time. And so he was trying to just grab all this information, including both stories, um, just to kind of cover his bases, cover his tracks a little bit. Um, But before we go into his motivation, what I want to do is do a little bit more research, dig a little bit deeper and put on our little thinking caps. Now, in the scholarly world, it is known that the book of Mark was actually the very first gospel written. Matthew was the first one in order as we read it in scripture, but Mark was the first one written. And then at the same time, there's this other book that the scholars called Q. I don't know what Q is. 
nobody's read Q, but we know that it was written around the same time and that all the other gospels reference this one book that unfortunately has been lost to history. And so the thought is maybe, you know, Matthew has taken stuff from Mark, he's taken stuff from Q, he's taken stuff from other these, all these other places, throwing them all together, and then like, eh, we'll just put them both in there and we're, we'll call it good. So that's, that's the backdrop. But now let's talk about the structure of what happens between Matthew 14 and Matthew 15. So the different stories, as you kind of look at the different headings that are in our current Bibles right now, you have the feeding of the 5,000, you have the miracle of Jesus walking on water, and I believe it goes to chapter 15, there's a conversation with religious people about defilement, and then there's a conversation with a Canaanite woman about how Jesus won't heal her daughter, and then... Finally, the feeding of the 4,000. Now, um, this, the way that this is structured might seem a little strange because you have the two feeding stories and a bunch of other random things um, that are in the middle, but let's do our research, right? Let's try to understand Matthew's motivation here. The way that these feeding stories were written are actually the same structure, right? Structurally, if you look at them and you read through those different passages, you have a group of people following Jesus, listening to what he says, They get really hungry. They find a little bit of food. Jesus blesses the food, delivers it out to all the people that are there, and there's baskets of that food that is eventually left over. But the way that these stories are different, one is in their location, where they take place. So the feeding of the 5,000 takes place centered around Jewish people. There's Jewish people there listening to Jesus, being fed by Jesus. And in the feeding of the 4,000, they're actually in a completely different place away from Jewish people altogether and kind of taking place with Gentiles, with non-Jews around him, near Tyre and Sidon. Another thing to notice is the baskets that were were left over. So in the feeding of the 5,000, it says that there was 12 baskets left over, right? And in the feeding of the four, there was only seven. Now, let me just kind of prod a little bit. How many tribes of Israel were there? 12. Yeah, exactly. So the thought is maybe these 12 baskets that are left over, that this detail that was included that God put in here was a reference to the 12 tribes of Israel, the same 12 tribes that were in captivity in Egypt and led to the promised land by Moses. Now, what would be important about the number seven? Well, When we read in the Exodus story, once the people kind of come out to the promised land, there are seven different ites, right? These different enemies of God's people. There were the Hittites, there were the Girgashites, I think it was the the Parasites, the Stalactites, the Dustmites. No, it's different. There's a lot of, there's a few different ites. Some of those, maybe, some of those, maybe not. Stalactites was really convincing for me. But these seven groups of people were known as the enemies of God's people, right? They were charged to, um, they were at war with Israel at different points throughout time and throughout history. Now, there are two connections that we can make here, right? We have Jesus and we have Moses. We have Jesus in the new and we have Moses in the old. Now, remember what we were saying about Matthew's kind of motivation, right? Right? His motivation is to say that Jesus is the fulfillment of all the Old Testament, including Moses. So, with that in mind, the next question is how are these stories that are in between the two feeding accounts, if they have any importance? Do they have anything to do with Jesus, as the book of Hebrews says, being the greater Moses? So, you have the feeding of the 5,000, right? What could we equate this to when we look at the story of Moses leading the people in the Exodus story, and just a little bit before too? Maybe it could be the Passover meal, right? It's this last meal that the people had during the last plague, right before they were released to go out, um, out of Egypt. The next story that we read about in Matthew is Jesus walking on water, right? This huge miracle involving water. What could be something in Moses' story that maybe involved a big piece of water? Could be the splitting of the Red Sea, where he sticks his staff in, water parts, people walk across dry land, and then God uses that miracle of separating the sea to then kill uh, the, the army that was after them, getting them free out of captivity. 
Now, in the, the New Testament, in the book of Matthew, what happens after Jesus walks across the water, he picks Peter up, they get in the boat, and then they sail across to this unknown, or no, it's a known land, but they sail across to this land that was no longer part of the Jewish territory. Now, in the story of Moses, you know, once they cross the Red Sea, they're in uncharted land. They have no idea what's around them. They've never been there before. They're around people who are not a part of them. They're in a new, new place surrounded by Gentiles. Now back again to the book of Matthew, we have the story of Jesus talking with these religious people about the laws of defilement and cleanliness. But in the story of Moses, what do we have? We have God giving Moses the law. We have God giving Moses these rituals and these practices in order to keep themselves clean, in order to keep themselves separate from the world that was around them. The next thing we have in uh, the, the story of Moses then is after they are in this new land, they get the law. They are then to go into the promised land and then they're supposed to then remove the people, these ites, right, from the promised land so that way they can go to what God had promised them. But the next two stories in the book of Matthew, you have first this conversation with, as Matthew put it, a Canaanite woman. But if you think about it and you've done some research, you know that by the time this happens in the New Testament, Canaan is no longer a, a place, you know, the, the Israelites have already moved in. They've expanded. They've done their thing. It's like calling somebody a confederate in today's world. Like the confederate states of America hasn't been around since 1865. And so what Matthew is doing is he's using very specific language to try to communicate something about who this woman was. That, in fact, this woman was a part of a people group who were seen as the enemy of God. And what happens in that story? Well, she asks Jesus to heal her daughter and he says, no, like you're not one of me, so we can't heal you. But then later he hears her story and he says, you know what? I'm gonna heal your daughter anyways. Like we'll, we'll take care of her. And then that story is followed by the feeding of the 4,000 where Jesus and his disciples are in a land that's surrounded by Gentiles and he is now doing the same miracle that was done for the Jewish people, the people of Israel but now he's doing it for people that were known as his enemy. So the idea now is that Jesus is taking what is meant only for the Jews in the Old Testament, right? And he is now expanding it to everyone. This is kind of like what Matthew was talking about when he's saying that Jesus is the better Moses. Jesus is the fulfillment of the Old Testament into the rest of the world. He is now taking the Exodus story and superimposing it into the gospel to make this huge theological point about who Jesus is. So now, this seemingly contradictory moment of two different feeding stories is wiped away clean because we've done our research, because we understand the narrative motivation behind what Matthew was writing. And we get this full picture of why even those stories in between were included. So this isn't too bad, right? Like we're in school, but we're learning. Learning's fun, right? It's not, we're doing okay. So the last factor that we're now gonna talk about is to trust God and his word. Yes, we need to do research. Yes, we need to understand the motivation behind what we're reading. But we also, at the end of the day, need to trust God and what he's telling us through his word and that it is true. So now the next contradiction is gonna come out of the book of Acts, chapter seven. We're only gonna be there for a little bit, so if you don't wanna flip there, that's fine. If you want to, that's fine too. We're gonna come back to Genesis here in a second. But it starts in the book of Acts chapter seven and this next contradiction takes place in the midst of Stephen's speech right before he gets martyred. Now a reminder, Stephen is a young man who was chosen as one of the first deacons to help the elders with the church in Israel to do kind of some of the other jobs that were being asked of them. And Stephen was super good about like preaching the gospel. Like he loved God, loved Jesus and his story and what Jesus meant to the world. And so he's doing a good thing by sharing the gospel with everybody. But some people didn't like that. There are people who didn't like who uh, he was and were like, you know what? Let's get him in trouble because we don't like him. We don't like what he's doing. 
So then they come before what's called the Sanhedrin, which if you think about it in today's world, it's kind of like the Supreme Court, but for the Jewish people. And so they come before the Sanhedrin, giving false witness and false testimony about who Stephen is and what he is even saying. And so they go, they see Stephen, they bring him before the Sanhedrin, and again, more false testimony is said, to, said about him. And so he then uh, is about to give his side of the story. He's about to start speaking. And what the Bible says is that the Holy Spirit came upon him and his face shone like an angel. And that's where chapter seven begins. Stephen goes into a lengthy discourse, giving the history of the Jewish people, specifically through Moses. And the contradiction I want to look at is starting at verse four of chapter seven. And it says this. So he left the land of the Chaldeans and settled in Haran. After the death of his father, God sent him to this land where you are now living. Now, Stephen, what he's referencing right now at this point in his speech is he's talking about Abram. And when Abram finally left the land that he grew up in and is moving as God had commanded him. And it look, might look normal to some people. You're looking at like, okay, that makes sense. His story is good. We're moving on. But what I want to do now is actually take a look at the book of Genesis in chapter 11 and 12 at what Stephen is actually referencing in history. So in chapter 11, uh, verse 26, it says, after Terah had lived 70 years, he had became the father of Abram, Nahor, and Haran. Those were the three sons of Terah. So he was pretty old when he had kids. I don't know if any of you that are over the age of 70 would ever think about having kids at this age. I'm 30 and my son's already a handful. I, I couldn't imagine it at that age. So it's pretty crazy. He's pretty old. Um, but now what I want to do is look a couple verses down at verse 32. Genesis 11:32 says that Terah lived 205 years and he died in Haran. So we see that he was really, really old when he eventually died. But what I want to do now is look at Genesis 12 where it actually mentions Abram leaving his hometown to go where God had called him. Genesis 12, four says, so Abram went as the Lord had told him and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. Now, if you do some math, if Terah lived 70 years before he started having kids and Abram was 75 when he eventually left, that would only make Terah 145 years old, right? But, as we read, Terah died at 205. So the math doesn't really seem to be mathing to me. But what's interesting here is you don't see any kind of opposition coming from the Sanhedrin. You see, like, Stephen was a well-learned Jewish kid, Jewish boy, now young man. The whole Sanhedrin was filled with Jewish people who would have known by memory the entire Torah, the history of the Jewish people. And they didn't object to that moment, that sta statement of after Terah died, then Abram left. They didn't object. But they did later object to him calling them out for being the ones that killed the just one or the promised Messiah um, that was written about in the Old Testament prophets. But one explanation that people have given to explain why Stephen said it this way is that in Genesis eleven twenty six it says, after Terah had lived 70 years, that's when his three sons were born. But... So when you look at it, you think, okay, once Terah had lived 70 years, then he started having kids, which again, crazy. I couldn't imagine doing that myself. But that would mean that Terah wouldn't have had Abram until he was at least 130, right? Because then when Abram was 75, that's 205, 130 plus 75, 205. All right, the math makes sense. But what doesn't, and when this argument kind of falls apart, is that when... Um, Abram himself started having kids. The Bible says that he was 90, 100 years old, right? And when God promises to Abram and Sarah, his wife, the fact that they would have kids, he's like, oh, that's crazy. That's ludicrous. That couldn't happen. So how could a guy whose dad was 130 when he had him not think that having a kid at 100 years old would make sense? So that's where this kind of falls apart a little bit. And I don't think this makes sense so much. Another potential solution is to this issue, and the one that I kind of think personally happened, we're not sure, but the one I think, 
is that Stephen is merely referencing the order that these events took place within the writings. Because you got to remember, uh, when these writings were, were happening, they were written on scrolls. There was no chapter or verse references. And there was no little headers saying what part of the story we were talking about. And so in the writing, it would have come from Tara's age when he started having kids, Tara's death. And the next thing we read about is, hey, you know, Abram's leaving. Um, and he's going to a different land. So when we read this story, it went from one thing to the next. Unfortunately, the biggest thing that, well, I guess fortunately, one thing for us to keep in mind is that we weren't there, right? We weren't there when Stephen was giving his speech to the Sanhedrin. We weren't there when Moses was leaving Haran. And so we cannot know fully what Stephen was meant, what Stephen meant when he was saying this. And that's okay. And that might be a little uncomfortable for some of you to think that it's okay to not know 100% about certain things that happen in the Bible. And the next logical thought then would be, okay, well, would it be safe and would it be okay to, to say that there are minor errors within the Bible? You know, there's plenty of other historical books that are out there that, you know, there's minor errors for similar situations um, from different authors that are, are known as credible. But to that question, I would respond with this quote from a book called Thy Word is Truth by Edward J. Young, where he says, the proper method of dealing with difficulties is not to dismiss them as positive errors. For if the Bible is indeed God-breathed, it follows that it must be true and infallible. To assume that God could speak a word that is contrary to fact is to assume that God himself cannot operate without error. The very nature of God, therefore, is at stake. So if we believe that the Bible was God-breathed, then how could the creator of the universe, who is all things true, all things holy, all things good, then tell us something that is contrary to his own nature? He goes on to say, if God has communicated wrong information, even in so-called unimportant matters, he is not a trustworthy God. At this point, could even the entire Bible be something that we can trust? I know I've grown up hearing that. I know I've, I've grown up hearing that it's a, histor a historical book and it's something that we can put our faith in because God wrote it. And you know, in the book of Matthew, Jesus even quotes the Torah as historical. He quotes it, saying it, and believes it. So with that, would, could Jesus then be mistaken? Or even if we read about this story of Stephen, it says that he was filled with the Holy Spirit and then said what he said. So could the Holy Spirit then be able to tell something that wasn't true? Well, the Holy Spirit would not make a mistake. Jesus could not make a mistake. So our trust is ultimately in the God of the universe. But maybe you're listening to this and you haven't grown up in the church or this is something that you're struggling with and wrestling with and you don't understand fully. Or maybe you know people in your life who don't necessarily believe in Jesus or believe that Jesus is who he says he is or that the Bible is what we as Christians have said that it is. Well, then I will tell you the same thing as the three factors that we just went through today. To do your effective research, to understand the narrative motivation behind the Bible, and to then trust God in his word. So, if you don't trust that the Bible is what it says it is, do some research, right? So if you look up information about the Bible, then you'll be able to know that it is the most copied and still is the most copied historical text in the entire world. There's this guy by the name of Dr. Kenneth Boa who wrote uh, in this publication called Knowing and Doing. And in his writings, he said, back, this was back in 2009, it said that the quantity of the New Testament manuscripts is unparalleled in ancient literature. There are over 5,000 Greek manuscripts, 8,000 Latin manuscripts, and another 1,000 manuscripts in other languages, Syriac, Coptic, etc. In addition to this extraordinary number, there are tens of thousands of citations of New Testament passages by the early church fathers. In contrast, the typical number of existing manuscript copies of any of other works of Greek or Latin authors, such as Plato, Aristotle, Caesar, or Tacitus, ranges from one to 20. 
And what's crazy to me is that the works of these other authors that we just listed are often seen as more reliable than something like the Bible. Right? I don't know if you've heard that. Well, that's crazy because even through the many, many copies that we have of the Bible, it still has 99.5% accurate accuracy to even the oldest manuscripts that we have today, which is absolutely astonishing. Also, when you do your research and you read your Bible and you get to know what it says, you'll start to understand the narrative motivation. You know, you'll be able to see the story of how God is faithful and trustworthy to his people. All the way from Adam and Eve to the beginning of the Bible, all the way through to Jesus' life, death, burial, and resurrection on the cross, from the cross. All of the visions at the end of the world point to the redemption of the world back to the creator through Jesus. And another way that you can then do your effective research and understand some motivation is by hearing personal testimony from the people that claim to follow Jesus, from other followers of Jesus, listening to their testimony because not only is he the God of the Old and New Testament, he's still very much the same God that is here with us even today through the Holy Spirit and the God that is yet to come that we put our hope in. So what I would like to do now is give you an example through my own life, through my testimony in a, in a moment that happened in my life for when God was able to show me that he is in fact worthy of trust. So I've been here at New Hope now for almost a year. It's been 11 months, which is wild, praise God. Um, and before Gian and I came here to New Hope, we were at a church in Hanford, and now things were going well. We knew that it was about time for us to leave Hanford and, and come back out here to Clovis where the rest of our family and friends are. So we started making our move. And with that, I have this desire that I didn't want to work for a church anymore. I was kind of done with the amount of responsibility that I was given, which is kind of silly with the kind of job that I have now. Um, I was over it. I just wanted to go to church. I wanted to be just an awesome volunteer and do great things at a church and, and just attend. No responsibility, it was awesome. And so I, I started looking into a job opportunity. I was working on it, it was going well. And then I got distracted by another opportunity that came up. And when that opportunity fell through, I was like, well, dang, that kind of is, uh, is unfortunate because the amount of time between my last paycheck from my job in Hanford and um, what I needed to do for the rest of my time, there wasn't enough time to make the first opportunity work. And so then I was like, all right, so I'm looking around, nothing, 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 and nothing was panning out. Nothing was coming through. And I don't know if any of you all had been, have been in a moment where you have had the most anxiety you've ever had in your life to be able to even question and think, if, I don't even know where food is going to come from because... I have no, nothing else coming in. Not, not to mention the fact that the job that we thought Gianna was going to have, that disappeared. That got taken away from her. And there's only so much that unemployment can help out with. And so it led me to this point of the, the, truly the most anxiety that I've ever had. That it got me to even question and say to God, like, God, are you even there? Do I even believe that you are listening to me, that you are here? that you care for me. Because I'd spent so much time asking and pleading with God for an opportunity for work, for something, so that way I could be a good husband and a good father when Nash was born. And I could be a provider. And I was asking God for that help. And it, it led us to such a low point that I think God finally humbled not just myself, but Gianna as well, to even get to the place where we can say, okay, Maybe we can look for a church job. Maybe that's something that God's not done with me yet. Now, Gianna had kind of grown up in the high school group here at New Hope, and so she knew who Teddy was. So she got a hold of him. She was like, hey, Kyle's looking for work. Like, does anything happen? Like, what's going on at New Hope? And he responded back saying that he had just gotten out of an elder board meeting where they had talked about the possibility of an associate pastor job. And that was... Amazing because this was a type of job that I was looking to do because I love being a worship pastor and leading worship, but it's something that I knew I didn't want to do for the rest of my life. 
And so cleaned up my resume, sent it over, had an interview with Pastor Mark, with Tim, with Teddy. That led to an interview with the entire elder board. And God was so good. The offer that you, the church, was able to give me for me to do this job that I get to do even now was perfect. It was just enough for us to be able to have a life here in Clovis. And I thank God because it's exactly what we needed. And even the conversations that I had with Pastor Mark once I got here, seeing his vision and his desire and his heart for the church was something that I could agree with and was excited about with a church and a family here that I can trust, not just with me, but with my wife and my kid. In a place I was excited to see God move in. See, our God who's the one true God, the creator of the entire universe, is a good and loving God. And as you study his word and become more and more familiar with what it says and even hear stories of God's faithfulness even from imperfect people like myself, you will be able to see and know and have confidence that he is in fact trustworthy. And his word is something to be held with a high regard. So let's pray. God, we love you. God, thank you. Thank you for this job that I get to have and the blessing that it is to both me, to my son, to my wife. Thank you for the many opportunities that you've given me to show me your faithfulness and show me your goodness and that you are in fact trustworthy. And so Lord, I ask that today that you would do the same in the rest of everyone that is here today, God, that you would stir in their hearts, that you would remind them of your goodness and that you would bring moments to them where they can look at and say, yes, God, that was you. I can trust you. That I could actually believe that your word is what you say it is. So God, help us. Help us to want to know you more. Help us to want to read your word. Help us to want to love you and know you more and more each day. Because God, we do love you and we do need you. And it's in your precious and holy name that we pray. Amen. We are still in our sermon series on the word of God. And I hope that this series in general, this key to the discipleship of a life of discipleship and service. I, I hope that this overarching theme that we've got going for the year, but this particular series is really spoken to you in a way that you can begin to understand, to better understand what it is uh, to have the Word of God in our lives. It's history, it's foundation, it's structure, it's truthfulness, because Scripture really is one of the absolute foundational uh, parts of our walk with Christ. It's a picture of God. It's a love letter from God. And it's a field handbook for us to to know exactly what it is that we need to be doing in every circumstance in our life as disciples of Christ. So this morning I want to close out this short series with how we actually apply the Word of God to our lives. What does all this mean to us? What do we do with this precious information that we have in our mind? What difference is it going to make to us today or tomorrow or next week or next year, whenever it is that we're going to need it, basically every day. But it's, it's all very well knowing the facts about the Bible, understanding the way that it's put together, but there's so much more than that. In John 13, there's a story where Jesus washes the feet of his disciples. And he says to them after he's done that, he said, do you understand what I've done for you? And the disciples at that point could easily have just said, well, yeah, you washed our feet. We came in here with dirty old feet, and now they're clean, simple. But Jesus wasn't talking about the act itself, the act of washing their feet. He was talking about the why that's behind it. And he goes on to say, now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. This is the application of 
of being this, of the servant leadership that Jesus had. It's the application of his word that now is the next logical thing to look at in this series. Because application is where the rubber meets the road. Application is where the truth goes from the theoretical to the practical. A Bible open just for observation or slight interpretation really is just a decoration. The Apostle Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 8, knowledge puffs up. Well, love builds up. Knowledge of the Bible, whereas the application is the love that comes from that. That builds us up, not puffs us up. Knowledge alone is not enough. There's plenty of Christians that know huge amounts about the Word of God, but then they have trouble applying it to their own lives. They don't take the practical steps that are involved in what's said in this book. On the other hand, when knowledge from His Word hits you, man, sometimes it really hits you. I mean, Scripture can really hit you. There's a story uh, on, in Luke 24 about uh, the road to Emmaus. So this is after God, uh, this is after Jesus has been resurrected from the dead. And now they're on this road to Emmaus. And it says, now that same day, verse 13 of Luke 24, now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them, named Cleopas, said, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in in these days? What things, he said. Jesus is asking, what's been going on in Jerusalem? Of course, he knows very well. And they, then he begins to they explain the happenings of what's been going on in Jerusalem. They're telling Jesus himself about what happened to Jesus. Uh, and it continues in verse 27. It says, And the beginning with, at the beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in the scriptures concerning himself. As they approached the village that they were going, Jesus continued on as if he was going further. But they urged him strongly, Stay with us, for it is nearly evening. The day is almost over. So they went, he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he disappeared from from their view. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us when he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures up to us? And that's the key verse I want to focus on just for a second. It says, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures up to us? Because their hearts were burning when the scriptures were being shared with them. Of course, if Jesus himself is sharing the scriptures, then yes, it probably does create much more of a burning in your heart. But this is what the knowledge of scripture can do for us. It can act as a fire in our hearts that will ignite the action that is needed to apply the word of God to our everyday lives. So we've got the word right here. The passion, the fire that the Holy Spirit helps us with inside is what drives us on, ignites that fire to get the action going in our lives. And then their passionate response, these gentlemen on the road to Emmaus, uh, from this insight that they had, that they gained from that, they turned immediately into action. They returned to Jerusalem to encourage the other fellow believers in what they had learned. So now for this application process, I'm going to get into uh, an area that I frequently get into, and that is aviation. I'm going to dip back into the world of aviation for a second because that's my comfort zone, I guess. But anyway, um, so when I had a flight school, there were frequently people would come in to visit the flight school. They would sit in my office. They would sit in front of me and say, I want to learn to fly. And at that point, I would walk them through the usual process of explaining exactly what that entailed, how many hours they needed to get at a minimum or the average or whatever it is, how many hours they need to do with an instructor versus how many hours they need to do on their own or doing solo flight. Uh, I would set the expectations, make sure that they suddenly understood that this is not just an investment in time, but it's also quite a significant investment in money as well probably more than they expect, because things don't always go exactly the way that you expect them to. So, once I've made sure that we're all on the same page, and when they were ready to get started, I would hand them their study materials. And this is missing two books. I couldn't find them. It's been a while. So... (laughs) So I'd hand them their, their study materials, and they would look at that, and their first response to it would be, seriously? They'd look a little crestfallen. 
They would look a bit sort of put off by the whole thing. And they'd look at me and say, well, isn't this a practical skill? I mean, I'm just going to learn how to fly. And I'd say, yes, it is. But you don't have to study all of this, just most of it. For example, this is the book of regulations, the Federal Aviation Regulations, as well as the Airman Information Manual. But there's a large number of regulations in this book. Do you have to know them all? No. As a recreational pilot, you don't have to know many of these particularly, just certain ones in here. And this is just one book. Then the airlines have a different book. And then the, the uh, repair stations have a different book of their own. So, you know, it's just there's a lot of regulations in the airlines. You don't have to know every single regulation to be a pilot. But the bottom line is that when you want to learn to fly a plane, you have to start with some of the basics. And some of the basics and a lot more are in these books that I hand you when you first decide that you want to be a pilot. You begin to work on the fundamentals. It's good to know the different parts of a plane. It's good to know what happens when you press on one of the, the pedals on the, uh, in, the, in the plane and what happens and why, that kind of thing. But just as with every student, you just want to get in the plane and fly. If you walk into a flight school, you know, I want to learn to fly. The first thing you want to do is get in a plane and go fly. And then I hand you this stack of books, and you're like, I don't know. Do I really want to do that? But we also need to know some fundamental things. Why does an airplane fly? How does the engine work? What are the different configurations for takeoff and landing? What kind of weather affects you in different ways? How does flight planning work? How do you read charts? How, do you, how does the flight environment affect you mentally and physically? These are all things that you need to know when you become a pilot. And there's a lot of this that all comes together. But if you were just to get into a plane and 